Hello, everyone, and welcome to How to Chess. We are joined this time by an adult improver, someone I've been online friends with for a while. He blogs frequently on Lee Chess, sort of details his chess journey. You can also find his blog uh, through his social media where he goes by the Ono Zone. He is a chess coach, a chess blogger, an adult improver, a dad. He got into chess around Queen's Gambit and has made pretty good progress up to about 1850 uh, on Lee Chess. And always enjoy reading his um, his deep reflections on the progress of his chess and uh, on life in general. And I thought he would be a good person to discuss role models with because I know he has an unusual chess role model, at least someone that is not named most frequently as a chess role model. And we will discuss that momentarily. But let's first, let's welcome Ono to the show. Welcome, Ono. Thanks very much for having me, Ben. Yeah, excited to chat. And I thought of you when I was brainstorming. I had this theme in mind, and you were one of the first people I thought of amongst, you know, there'll be grandmasters and well-known trainers also included in this season. But there was one person in particular who I'd read a post that you mentioned as a role model. And let's reveal who that is. Which player was it that you had identified as someone whose game you looked up to? Uh, Grandmaster Keith Arkell, who I, I first heard about when you interviewed him on Perpetual Chess. Yeah, so kind of legendary English player, um, not legendary in the historic for all time, with all apologies to Keith, <laughs> but legendary because he uh, he travels throughout the UK and he cleans up these weekend tournaments. And of course, he's obviously an amazing player um, to, uh, in the 2500 fee days, but He's renowned for his endgames in particular. Um, his most recent book was called Arkell's Endgames, and I'm a big fan of it. And what was it that resonated with you about Keith's uh, playing style, Ono? Um, I think b- before I really fell in love with his, his style of playing chess, it was more this hierarchy of pawns thing that he had that just made me feel very curious, uh, basically. I, I just didn't understand it. Um, I, I hadn't been playing chess for very long when I, I first heard his interview on perpetual chess. And so I just didn't, I didn't really get it. And I wanted to investigate that for myself. And once I got into that, that sort of led me down a rabbit hole of, of studying um, his games and uh, the different structures that come out of the openings he play plays. But yeah, I just, once I actually... Um, Start, started looking at his games. I just remember laughing at his ability to turn every position into this sort of dry end game position and uh, to, to turn everything into the, the sort of uh, structures that he likes, this sort of um, 4v3 um, on, the king's, on the king's side. Um, it was just amazing to see. Yeah, it is amazing to see. Um, it, it is a unique style. I mean, of course, there are other grandmasters known for their endgame prowess, Magnus Carlsen, Ulf Anderson, Akiba Rubinstein. Um, but Keith has sort of refined it even more, where I feel like more so than these other players, he's going out of his way to get them into end games, he's going out of his way to play long games. If he reaches an equal position, you know, he's rated 2,500 against someone like me, 2,100 player. If he's in an equal position on move 25, as he writes about, he feels like he's got, he's got you right where he wants you. The game is just beginning. He's going to torture you for hours and eventually he's going to get the result that he wants. Um, and I, there is something, especially I feel like aspirationally, there's something admirable about it because as I mentioned, when I interviewed Keith, I'm not sure I would actually want to play that long all the time, but, but it's, it's almost like in principle, it's a beautiful idea. Um, but we should probably explain for listeners a bit more about the hierarchy of pawns. Basically, uh, Keith power ranks the pawns by what rank they start on, which is, as Ono says, a pretty unique concept. Um, I actually don't remember the rankings offhand other than that center pawns are better than wing pawns. Do you happen to remember them, Ono? Or what What did you uh, determine once you did dig a little deeper? Yeah, I mean, so he. I think, uh, you know, I think the the sort of general guiding light or consensus is you should capture towards the center whereas he sort of says that the the e pawn is slightly more valuable than the d pawn and the f pawn slightly more valuable than the e pawn which made absolutely no sense to me until you start to look at his games and you see that every game he plays this minority attack attack idea wins a singular pawn uh from that and then basically grinds out these uh rook end games that are sort of 5v4 or 4v3 on the other side of the board. And I guess that's just what he, he likes. Um, so 
at least that was, I mean, I probably better to ask Keith exactly why, but that become, came to be my understanding of uh, why um, he actually valued these pawns more. Uh, yeah, the famed Carlsbad structure, of course, as you were referred to it, and in, on the theme of role models, um, as as has been discussed in other episodes, uh, you can have role models for particular openings or structures. Now, but I feel like it's more generally end games. Did you already feel like you gravitated towards studying end games before that interview, or is that something that developed from that? Or no? No, it definitely developed from that. I think I I really resonated with what he was saying about the practicalities of that approach. For some reason, I just had this terrible fear of children in chess <laughs> when I first started the idea that they could memorize these uh, long opening sequences. And I was sort of like seeking to somehow avoid that, even though I was not in a position where I was having to play children. And I still still am not uh, really. Um, but that, that was kind of where it came from. I thought, well, and it also just felt like some kind of competitive advantage. Uh, you know, I just kept hearing end games are boring no one wants to study end games it's such a chore and i was like well if i just force myself to love end games that is maybe going to be some kind of um, practical advantage particularly if you adopt a, a repertoire like keith's where you're sort of uh, entering these end games maybe a little bit sooner than um, than you would otherwise yeah, and I think you're onto something there. I think it could be a competitive advantage. So you mentioned you kind of felt like you had to force yourself. Now, did it take? Like, once you started doing that, did you feel like, oh, I, I'm kind of enjoying this, or was it kind of a chore the whole time? No, not at all, actually. I mean, I, I was, <laughs> I went through a few obsessions with it. I remember just being completely obsessed with Rook Endgames for a while. And I, I, I'd i set myself this sort of uh, Neil Bruce-style structure to... Um, you know, I had like blocks of different types of end games. I started with pawn end games, and um, I think rook end games was maybe even just the second block. But um, although prior to that, I'd done sort of general theory work for like six months, and that could have been a bit dry sometimes. But no, like most of that, I just became obsessed with it. I just really kind of fell in love with the nuances of of these different types of end games. I remember like the Saavedra position, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, just like oh, blowing yeah. me away Beautiful as Indian like party. a just the yeah. geometry of like, you know, the limitations on the rook. I remember like specifically in uh, the book uh, Amateur to I Am, I think it's Jonathan Hawkins. Uh, I can't yeah. exactly remember, but uh, yeah, just uh, like the idea of checking distance, which is obviously something probably really simple for a lot of people, but learning about these things for the first time was just really beautiful to me. And uh, yeah, just something I really enjoyed. So no, I, it, it, although uh, it was maybe boring at times with the TD to start with, uh, it definitely wasn't boring. Like I think if you really get into something, anything can become really interesting. And as you started to emulate him, okay, so you've decided that you like that he's he prides himself on being a great endgame player and gets a lot of half points and sometimes full points based on superior skill and uh, superior stamina in the endgame. But... As you mentioned, he also gravitates towards certain structures, the Carlsbad, and if I remember correctly, I think he plays the Carol Khan against uh, E4. Um, did you copy his openings as well, or were you already playing some of his openings, or was your uh, role model strictly related to sort of a more general approach? Um, initially, I didn't, um, because I, I had really good results playing the French, but um, yeah, I, I did eventually just switch, and now... Um, I just copy his opening repertoire. Um, I use the Lee Chess Opening Explorer to basically check all my games after I play them and see what he plays <laughs> and see where I first deviated from what Thurkel plays, basically. Um, yeah, there's a, there's only one exception, which is he plays the Fianchetto against the King's Indian, and I play this uh, Smyslov Petrosian system, which I just prefer. So, but uh, apart from that, uh, everything's the same. If uh, anyone wants to prep for me now, <laughs> they can just look up Keith Urkel's. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Well, yeah, we can all be tracked down if people try hard enough. Unfortunately, these days. And I know you were a Queen's Gambit convert. So when you picked up the Carol Khan from him, did you also find that the Carol Khan is all pawns and no hope, or no? <laughs> I really struggled with it in the beginning, uh, especially because my my win rate with the French was so good. Uh, I I took a sort of big hit, but my you know my approach to 
openings is the same with my approach to chess. I just feel like, okay, even if the Karakan turns out not to be for me, if I play 100 games in it and uh, it goes badly, at least I'll have learned something from those structures. I'll have learned something from that opening and I, I can move on. But uh, my, my my win rate does seem to have stabilized somewhat with it and I'm slowly um, slowly learning it. Yeah. Okay. And last question on the subject of your, your role model, Grandmaster Keith Arkell. Is, is he aware uh, of your fandom? Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. I did reach out to him to ask if there were if there was anyone else like him because I was, you know, looking for more material to study. Uh, he mentioned that Magnus Carlsen was uh, probably the closest to his style, which I thought was uh, uh, okay. interesting, but he obviously has the same grinding style rather than the same um, preferences for those structures, which was kind of what I was looking for. But I think uh, it seems he's pretty unique in the world of chess in uh, the way he goes into these uh, structures at the the expense of the advantage, which I think means doesn't mean much to me in an opening, but means a lot at the grandmaster level. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So I guess you, as a, as a trainer, you either have to hire Keith or Magnus Carlson. Yeah, it needs to be seen I mean, which one. I'd love to take a lessons with Keith Urkel one day, and you know, I think there, there's also something to be said about his games in particular. You know. Magnus Carlsen, you can study his games, but Magnus plays against other top players because Keith Arkell uh, has played a lot of these weekend tournaments. I feel that there's a lot to learn from his game be- games because he's played against lower-rated players. So often the plans that he tries to put in place, you can actually see come on the board because he's played... Uh, because they're allowed to come on the board, essentially, uh, which is not always right. something you can even notice uh, in top-level chess because I think... Uh, what they're trying to do never is actually realized because it, it stopped somehow, right? Um, or, or yeah, that's a not very visible good point. At the surface. And, yeah, that's a very good point. And by the way, there's a there's a free end game lesson from Keith Arkell on Chessable. So definitely, if listeners want to get a little taste, you can check that out for free. And on the broader topic of end games, oh no, um, are there any other resources that you found to be particularly helpful? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think. Probably of of all the things I've I've studied this year, my favorite has been uh, Grandmaster Johan Helstein's uh, Mastering Endgame Strategy course. I think uh, you know I, I, people put quite a high rating um, on that in terms of starting, but I think as with anything, if you've if you, if you've done the groundwork in endgames before it, then I don't think it really matters what rating you're at, you're at. I don't think I'm at the recommended rating level for it, but it's been uh, perfect for me to study from. Uh, given what I've studied before. Yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, Grandmaster Helson. And I do feel like with him, it's particularly true because the explanations are quite lucid. And if I were to put a rating on it, um, you know, if I'm, sub- I would su- I would put it maybe slightly above your level, but not astronomically. And of course, Arco's Endings is available on Chessable as well if you like the free preview. Um, which one would you recommend tackling first, Ono? Um. I would start with mastering endgame strategy because it's, uh, you know, without a sort of, especially if you uh, aren't um, very clear on your sort of basic endgame principles, uh, things like King First and, you know, just these sort of general gl- guiding lights, I think Arkel's book will be is, is a bit of a step up, I would say. Yeah, and I've read both books. And the other thing I would say is that uh, Johan's book is in, in sort of quiz format. Um, I would consider it, uh, slightly more deliberate practice if I were tackling that, but whereas Keith's is more uh, game analysis, um, it's you can at least for me, I often review that in a slightly more relaxed fashion where I'm still trying to learn from it, but I'm not necessarily learning as actively as I would be when I'm doing like quiz after quiz, um, as you do with uh, Grandmaster Helston. Um, but oh no, this has been a lot of fun hearing about your your uh, chess role models. Um, before we go, so I know you've got a busy life, uh, trying trying for that elusive work life dad chess balance, um, <laughs> and I know you primarily play online. But do you have any tournament aspirations? Uh, what's going on with your chess game? Um, for now, I'm sticking with the the uh, Lee Chess Lone Wolf and forty five forty five leagues. That's uh, that's what I can manage uh, at the moment. But yeah, absolutely would love to play over the board. I did manage last summer to play an over the board game in uh, Utrecht, the sort of home city of my um, my wife. But um, 
I would love to go back and maybe do that entire tournament this summer if we if we go back there for a more prolonged period this time. Nice. And how was that experience? That limited experience? I, honestly, amazing. Uh, I, I really, really enjoyed it. I, I was I was soundly defeated, but it was just I've never experienced that level of uh, pure focus uh, playing online. So. That was uh, really an amazing experience just to sit and get absolutely lost in that position for such a long time. And, you know, you feel like it's been five minutes, it's been two hours. It was really, really uh, incredible. I definitely recommend anyone who well started around when I did to, to try over the board. Yeah, that's, yeah, I always say it. try it. You might like it, you might not, but uh, it's a singular experience and uh, best to judge for oneself that the agony and the ecstasy, as you allude to. Um, <laughs> well, last thing, Ono, <laughs> as I said, I, I'm I'm quite impressed with the progress you've made as a chess player and also just sort of uh, wrapping your, your head around the, the vast chess world. Um, and I know that you do, you can help people with that, um, newer players who are looking for a coach. Uh, so if anyone is doing so, what is the best way to track you down? Um, yeah, my, I think, uh, you, you can contact me on Twitter. I've got a link tree in my uh, bio there, uh, with links to everything I do in the chess world. Uh, that's at the Ono zone, uh, Ono spelled O N O. And, um, you can also message me on Lee chess as well. It's the same, the Ono zone, uh, there too. Excellent. Well, thanks Ono. And, um, yeah, it's been been fun to hear about your admiration of uh, Grandmaster Arkel, and uh, hopefully you can get that lesson from him sometime. Maybe he'll even hear this interview. You never know. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too, man. Thanks very much for having me. I really appreciate it.